In the next, One Piece, Whitebeard appears from where you least expect. He was inside your heart. Maybe the real Whitebeards were the friends we Whitebearded along the way. <laughs> Maybe the real Whitebeards were the whites we bearded along the beard. <laughs> Maybe the white beards were the beard, the white beard, white beards. <laughs> Maybe the white beards were the white beard whites that the friends whited along the beard way. King of the what now's gonna take you down, gonna take you down. We're in for the yeah, it's getting hot now. It's getting hot now. King of the what now's gonna take you down, gonna take you down. We're in for the yeah, it's getting hot now. It's, it's getting, getting hot now. Boom. We've got a multi-act season, one, two, three. So come aboard to brave the sea. Supernovas and mystery. Warlords, wars, and tragedy. King of the what now's gonna take you down. Gonna take you down. Marine for dark, yeah, it's getting hot now. It's getting hot now. Celestial dragons, lowest of low. Overwhelming enemies, it's time to go. Luffy's gonna fight for his big bro, so now it's time to start the show. Boom. Hello, fellow warriors in the greatest war of our time, and welcome to episode 107 of King of the What Now, your one and only podcast that is also here to sell you One Piece themed fruit gummies. Nami's are tangerine flavored. Are they sparkling? Yeah, they're sparkling fruits. All of them are sparkling fruits. The sparklingest fruits that you can possibly imagine. Oh my goodness, what is your name, fruit gummy seller? We are a One Piece podcast covering the One Piece anime from the very beginning. As always, I'm your host, Joel, longtime fan of the series. And also, I've caught a bit of magma on a stick and I just blew it off like it was like an overheated meatball. Might take a bite into that later if I'm feeling hungry, if I'm feeling peckish. I don't think you should bite the forbidden meatball. But that only makes me want to nibble it even more. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious sakes alive. I'm Kat. I'm the ghost of the show. And I am just another face in a crowd full of people who seem really interesting and important. <laughs> but there's so many of us. So many. We'll get our names kind of dropped and people will be like, is that going to be someone important for later? Uh, someone on the wiki will be like, you actually saw this face 300 chapters ago. And everyone will go, what? But it turns out, no, if you go back, there he was. There he was in the background. I'm amazed at the people who keep track of that. I imagine they just must just have Excel spreadsheets. And every time a character shows up, they put them in the spreadsheet and then they like, check their spreadsheet every chapter to see if characters showed up that were characters before. Yes. I believe that there are, in fact, people with Excel spreadsheets. I have heard rumors, uh, and I believe that one of the members of the One Piece podcast, the big one, uh, has, like, chapters since this character was last on screen and stuff like that. I have not seen it, but that's what I've heard. So, before we go into the episodes that we just uh, reviewed, it's time for chatting with the host. And Catherine, we have been working on a very exciting project that actually is uh, live on Patreon at this moment by the time this will be uh, uploaded. But why don't you tell everyone about what we were up to? Yeah, absolutely. Are you talking about the Precure episode? We're talking about the Precure episode. Okay, excellent. Yes, we watched the first episode of every season of Precure that we hadn't already seen, and then we discussed it for almost three hours. <laughs> we had to split that episode into two halves. We thought the second half was only going to be half an hour and ended up going to almost an hour, probably a little bit more. It was 55 minutes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the first half was one hour and 20 minutes, so maybe we could have planned our split a little better. <laughs> but... I guess we just really like the, to hear ourselves talk about Magical Girls. So Precure is a really interesting series, and I'm really excited to see all of these seasons. I think it's going to be hard to get through the less interesting seasons, so we might have to do what we're doing for Futariwa and Tropical Rouge and like pair the ones we don't really care about with the ones we do really okay. want to see. I thought, you were, I thought you were trying to say that watching Tropical Rouge is eating our vegetables, and I was like, that is absolutely not the case. Uh, Tropical Rouge is the delicious dessert that you look forward to every week, but I see what you're saying now. So yeah, absolutely. They, we, I mean, the whole point of the bonus episode is his content just for our patrons, so I'm not going to give, like, too many thoughts, but, like, you should definitely give each of the first episodes of all 19 seasons a try and see, like, if any of them stand out to you. It is possible that some of these shows have strong starts and then they get a little bit weaker as they go on, or some of them might have really kind of mass starts and then they might pick up. 
For example, I've made no secret that Futari Wa did not really capture my interest the first time I tried to watch it, but now that I am forcing myself to watch it because I just want to be able to say that I've seen it all, it really does pick up after like six or seven episodes or so. And so. Absolutely. I had a friend once who said that his rule for shows and anime was three episodes. It's and a very if he wasn't rule. if mm-hmm. he wasn't hooked by episode three, he was done with it. But a lot of anime, especially older anime, I feel like takes until episode seven, eight, nine, somewhere around there to actually start the plot. There's a long time where you're just kind of getting to know the characters. And so I might I might revise that rule for myself and set like a, a 10 episode rule. Sure. Well, and I know some people who give off the impression that unless you've seen every single episode of the main series, uh, I'm not talking about seeing every episode of Tropical Rouge and, and Maho Sukai in order to judge Futari Wa, but like, until you've hit credits on episode 48, it does not count. And I kind of disagree with that. I think that you can generally tell whether something is interesting or not, and it's the director or author or whatever, it's the it's the creative team behind it, that has to put in the work to make the beginning interesting enough to keep you around for the rest. Absolutely. So. Also, if you are into shonen, which I assume you are because you're listening to this, it's possible that you're only into One Piece, and fair enough. But if you're into shonen, I assume that you like the found family and close friendships trope, and I assume you also like punching bad guys uh, and power-ups and all of that. And if those are the things you're into, Precure will check your boxes. I know people who refuse to watch it because they don't like quote-unquote girly shows. Give it a try. Yeah, there's some girliness. Like, if you are just looking at the the binary gender norms, which I think in 2021 are getting a little bit more flexible in a lot of circles, but if you look at things as either being girly or boyish, and you look at Tropical Rouge putting on their lipstick in order to gain courage, that would have to be girly by that binary, by it has to be one or the other, but it also has strong punchies and kickies. And so, like, it, you know, it's just... It, it, it's probably better than you might be thinking. We thought that the show looked kind of silly like eight-ish years ago, and now I'm a huge fan, and I, I, I regret not getting into it more and stuff like that. And I'm probably also going to check out Sailor Moon, for example, something that younger teenage me was like, oh, that's for girls. I'm a boy. I like, uh, well, actually, I don't like sports, and I don't really like cars, but yeah, I'm still a boy, gosh dang it. I play real video games like Mario, and I cry when the, uh, I'm not going to spoil that for you. Um, Is that a Paper Mario thing? Yeah, one of the Paper Marios has a very impactful scene, and it's really well done. But the only other thing that I want to say before we spend an hour and 20 minutes talking about different things that we didn't talk about in that bonus episode, uh, Go Princess has a scene that I don't think is the final battle, though the final battle is pretty good, but they have a pretty climactic episode that was airing at the same time as a Dragon Ball Super episode. And according to you, Kat, the the people who watched Go Princess were amazed. They're like, oh my gosh, this is how Dragon Ball Super should look. And this is how good it is. So if you like the punches and kickies, they've got those sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. The person who wrote that article was uh, at Ivanhoe on Twitter. (laughs) Yeah, we've talked about him a lot. And we're actually going to do a bonus episode uh, interviewing him about Precure and Toku and all of that. So look forward to that uh, next month. I think this episode's going up in June, but that's going to be our July bonus episode up on the Patreon. We also finished a very important show for you, Miss Cat. What show did we finish? We got behind the wheel. We we got into gear fourth and we sped off. Not gear fourth, whatever. uh, (laughs) We put the car in drive. Yes, we finally finished Common Rider Drive. And I, I thought it was a very sweet finale. Yeah. Like, they, they all kind of went their separate ways. I was kind of sad at some of the... Uh, it. I can't even really explain what <laughs> bothered me about the finale. But I will say I was hoping for some sort of uh, redemption living in peace moment between mm. the villains and the heroes and so, we like, don't really get that. If I, can, if I can try to, again, we're trying to avoid spoilers for like literally the last couple of episodes, but like if you start a season of the next season of Yu-Gi-Oh! And there's this asshole duelist who's like, I have the best cards that money can buy and I hate the main character because he's enjoying himself. You're going to think to yourself, okay, obviously I've seen this trope a million times before when we're going to get to the end of the episode 
end of the series, the bad guy will have a heel face turn and this rival will maybe end up being kind of like a friend. Kaiba never really became a friend with Yami, but he became an ally for the force of, you know, fighting the Dark Forces. Spoilers for the first season of Yu-Gi-Oh! But that, I don't really care. Everyone's seen Yu-Gi-Oh! So this show had something that I thought was an obvious plot hole or an obvious plot device or an obvious trope. And I was like, okay, when we get to the end of the series, obviously the evil dickhead rival is going to turn good. And then we got to the final episode and the credits rolled and I went, huh, they really did decide to lay the groundwork for a potential conflict to be resolved. And they just decided, you know what? No, that's too boring. Gotta make it uh, simple. I don't want to be harsh on Common Rider Drive. I've only seen the one season of Common Rider, and it is very good. It's better than all the other seasons we've seen, I think, or that we've tried to watch. The first three episodes, yes, to follow that same rule that we are talking about earlier. However, Drive is not for me. Uh, Drive is not as good as Tokyuger and uh, what was the other one? Kyu Ryuger was the Kyu one that Ryuger. we watched. Uh, and neither of those shows, in my opinion, are as good as Precure or, or One Piece. So in my informal ranking, right, uh, Drive did not get to S tier, but it is a strong A tier. I think as far as Tokusatsu goes, Tokyuger is still my favorite. Um, if we're counting Precure as Tokusatsu, which I don't think it does no. from the definition, but like in terms of tropes and storytelling devices and everything... It kind of falls yeah, in. Yeah, it's part of the superhero hour or whatever it's called in Japan. Precure still ranks pretty high on my list, um, but I would put Common Rider Drive as a close second. I liked it better than the dinosaur season of Sentai we watched, which yeah, is that's fair. a really hard name for me to remember and pronounce. There have been so many dinosaur seasons. We watched the one where they danced. Valuable mucho! The one with Buggy's voice actor to exactly. bring it back to. I'm also really excited uh, for Common Rider Ghost now. He has a cool suit and he's got this little tiny ghost that's voiced by Madoka Magica. <laughs> <laughs> and it just follows him around and like is mean to him. And I, I dig it. I've heard that that season is hit or miss with people. But, you know, like we were just saying, you got to give things a try. Yeah, absolutely. And something that works for you might not work for other people. I, for one, will never watch JoJo's Adventure Part 1 again because I've seen it and it was fine. But I do know other people who will strongly defend it and, uh, you know, get a little riled up if you mention that, you know, maybe it's not the best part of JoJo's. Look, this is not a JoJo's episode. We did one of those. Yeah. Uh, but Part 1 was better than Part 3. Like, Part 3 introduced stands and stands are cool. But part one, if you just take it as like a standalone series, if it had just been about the vampires and the sunlight energy and whatever, it was a solid story. Like I really enjoyed it. Whereas part three dragged so much that eventually we had to skip ahead to the part with Dio. Yeah, if part three had been uh, 20 episodes, it would have been amazing. But because it was 986, that's not an exaggeration, literally 986 episodes of JoJo's Adventure Part 3, and guess what power he's going to use in order to beat this bad guy? He's gonna punch real hard. But this is a show where we try to uplift the things that we like and we talk about things that we've been enjoying. And so it's kind of ironic that I want to talk about Invincible for a quick second, because I would not recommend that someone watch Invincible based off of my feelings that I felt while watching Invincible. But there's a lot of really interesting ideas in there. So in the first episode, these two supervillains attack the White House, and they come up in a sort of like a drill machine. They come up from underground, and they show up just outside uh, the White House walls or whatever. And they are referred to as the Molar Twins, and they look exactly alike in terms of physical appearance. I think they're wearing slightly different like shirts or something, but they're the same person. And one of them mentions, you said that the device was going to take us into the White House. And the other one goes, no, obviously the purpose is to instill fear in people. I did it on purpose. You would know that if you were the original. And I was like, the original? But they're twins. Oh, they might not be twins. They might be clones. And maybe they're just called twins because either the media doesn't know their backstory or it's just easier to call them the twins. And then there's a later uh, episode, I won't spoil things, and they don't get names, so you can't point at one and be like, that's Jeff and the other one's Beth, right? But I will call one of them A and one of them B, 
A is in a situation where you can help B. B is uh, is stuck and he needs help and A can help. And A goes, yeah, I can help, but you got to admit that I'm the original and you're the clone. And B goes, I'm the clone and you're the original. You're smarter than me. And A goes, good job. And then they escape together. Those two characters are fascinating. And you don't really find out, like, why are they giant blue men? Are they aliens? Are they humans that genetically modified themselves? Are they, what? what's their ultimate goal? Do they just want to take over the world? Because you get them in a couple of different scenes and it, it's, you can, the world of Invincible feels really well thought out. You can tell that every character has their own backstory, their own history. They have their own tensions with other characters. Uh, there's a uh, um, character that in my mind is like a mix of, um, what's the, What's the Hellboy and Constantine? So he's this red skinned devil that only appears, uh, he appears like magic, and people can see their breath misting over when he's in the room. And he talks in a way that's not quite the way that humans talk, but he's a detective and he's trying to solve superhero crimes. And every case he solves reduces the sentence of the amount of time that he's stuck in hell. Like, holy shit! The, the backstories are really fascinating. But it's very bloody, really brutally, grossly bloody. And uh, there's, it's one of those shows where, like, everything sucks, but at least some of the characters are hopeful, and that makes you hopeful. No, um, uh, uh, an entire country of people just died. And I cried like a baby. This is not a good time. I am not having a good time. This is why you watch Precure. Precure is safe for Joel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, like, if you like superhero stuff and you don't mind, like, over-the-top gross gore, yeah, give it a, a watch. I think that there's a lot of really interesting stuff about the story. But for me, it was just a little bit too heavy. And so I don't think that I'll be picking up season two. Yeah, well, and for me, uh, specifically, I've mentioned this before, but I am specifically sensitive to uh, like abuse or violence against women. And apparently that plays a pretty big role. So, you know, trigger warning. Yeah, trigger warning for that. Um, there's a scene, the, the first episode ends with a with a really powerful hook. And it's one of the goriest scenes in the show, and they do something in slow motion that made me go like, Jesus, why Why would I, why, why, who would want to watch this? But there's plenty of people who want to watch it, so. Mm -hmm. Where did it uh, rate, like, next to The Boys, for instance, in terms of, like, blood and, because The Boys, we were told, was pretty gross, and we didn't watch it for a long time because of that, and I did okay with that show. It's, it's, it's way worse. Okay. Yeah. Give it a look, give it a watch if you haven't seen it, if you want, but if you can't, if you don't really like the, the end stinger scene from, uh, the, the first episode, then you probably won't like the final two episodes. Uh, the animation in places can be a little spotty, but it has excellent voice cast. It has, um... Mark Hamill is the voice of a guy who, he's like the Edna of that world. He builds the super suits for all of the different um, superheroes. You have uh, Sandra Oh, who I know is Christina Yang from Grey's Anatomy, and that's the only thing I've seen her in, but she's like the mom of the main character. You have uh, J.K. Simmons playing the voice of Omni-Man. Like, there's some really good voice acting in there. There's some really good jokes. Like, I've shown Catherine a couple of scenes out of context, and she goes, oh, that's pretty good. Should I watch this? And I go, no, you would absolutely hate it, because when it's not funny, it's gross. Yeah. I've been rereading Six of Crows, continuing my Grishaverse read through. Okay. And man, is it just a near flawless uh, heist story. Uh, Grishaverse uh, podcast episode one yeah, is what I'm, I'm hearing. I'm, 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 I'm. I will say that the one flaw is that they are teenagers. I cannot, if I were reading this and I were like 13, because all the characters around are around 17 years old. If I were reading this and I were like 13, I'd be like, yeah, look at him go. But as someone who's almost 30, I'm looking at this and I go, there's no way these 17 year olds have the resources and emotional capability and uh, connections that is being portrayed in this book. Uh, and the TV show Shadow and Bone aged them up significantly. I think it made... Kaz Brecker like 22 or something yeah and so I think that goes a long way in making it helping me suspend my disbelief a little more sure um but other than that like I love high stories and this is a good one they're gonna go in the place they're gonna get the thing they're out of there <laughs> absolutely 
Really quick question, because the chatting with the host section has gone on a little long for my taste, but who is your favorite character? For sure, Kaz Brecker. And he's the main character? He is, yeah. I have a soft spot for characters who are kind of assholes. Mm-hmm. Well, he's a heist boy, you know? You like heist, but like, uh, is is his name Jesper? Jester? Jesper. Jesper? Jesper. Jesper is not the type who would do his own heist, because he just doesn't seem like that kind of character. Inej wouldn't do a heist. Brecker? Kaz Brecker? He would do a heist. Well, and the cool thing about this book specifically is that it has disability representation. Um, Kaz has a limp and has to walk with a cane, which the author put in because she has a very similar disability. Uh, And it has uh, different people of color. Like the whole cast is, you know, one person is from kind of their version of, I want to say Africa, and one version is from their version of Asia. Uh, And so it's a very diverse cast. They also have LGBT characters, and it's like a super normalized thing in this society. Nobody really comments on it. And so if you're looking for books with more representation, I think she really went out of her way to make that an element in this book. Yeah, no, absolutely. A a lot of the stuff like that makes me even more interested to read. If I had ever learned how to read, I'd be picking up this book and I'd be checking it out. Good news. Yeah? I do have the audiobook, you see. Cool. I never learned how to listen. (laughs) I've actually just been guessing at what you've been saying this entire time, and I just apparently... Maybe I'm getting it right. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe this joke is a little much on Mike. Maybe you're going to be like, oh, calling me out on Mike. But that actually tracks with how you respond sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. So the great thing about Omni Man, if you really think about it, you know. Okay. And that has been uh, your mic test. No, chatting chatting with the the host, host. my guy. Oh, no, my brain. It's all gooey. All right. So give me that sweet, sweet succinct summary. Really quick. One one quick note before we go into the succinct summary, we got our first ever YouTube comment now that we are on the YouTube uh, platform, so I just wanted to shout out uh, Papa. Thank you so much for your love and kindness. Uh, it kind of doesn't count as our first YouTube comment because it's a family member, but I do appreciate not all of our family members want to listen to a podcast about anime pirates. But. See, I thought we were going to put that in Tweets with the Bottle, but yes, shout out to Papa. Thank you for your sweet comment. We love you too. All right, so now I can get into that sweet, sweet, succinct summary. We just watched episodes 459 through 465, which in my opinion officially starts the Marineford saga. I think according to the wiki, 458 and 457 actually are the start, but they were like flashback, you know, kind of bullspit episodes. So we get into the meat and potatoes now. First two episodes, they're all backstories and flashbacks, but like, new information flashbacks. We find out that Ace is not the son of Monkey D. Dragon, but is in fact the son of Gold Roger, the infamous Pirate King. His mom held him in like an extra like 10 months or six months or something past when he would have been born so that- She carried him for 15 months. Okay, sorry. That's I knew that she, she carried him past when she, he would have been due- because the Marines were looking for the son of Roger, so they were looking for all pregnant women, but she managed to evade them, gave birth to her child, died in childbirth because, you know, she's a mom and this is one piece. And uh, then he Ace went out to sea, and he just he met Whitebeard, and Whitebeard's like, be my son, and Ace has father issues, and was like, no, F you, old man. And the old man's like, I think you'll come around eventually. And then Ace wakes up one day, and he goes... I've come around eventually. (laughs) So those are the first two episodes. Ace tries to insist that it was his fault that he went after Teach, which it was, it canonically is. But Whitebeard goes, nah, 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 nah. I warned you not to go after him. Doesn't everyone remember? Everyone remembers? And all the Whitebeard pirates went, yeah, we remember. You definitely told him to go, and it's your fault that Ace got locked up and is about to be executed. Those are the two flashback episodes. What we get next is a series of, uh... Violence. Well, yes, it's one piece. It's a, it's a, like a rally, like in tennis, where one team does something, the other team counters it. That team does something, the other team counters it. So Whitebeard uh, creates a tsunami. We'll get into new information in a second. He creates a tsunami that is going to flood Marineford. Aokiji freezes the, the flooding so that they're okay. Kizaru tries to attack them from above, but Marco blocks the attack and then kicks Kizaru away. Uh, Mihawk decides he's going to try to cut Whitebeard, but Jozu blocks the attacks and deflects it away. Uh, Jozu picks up a giant ice chunk and throws it at the Marine headquarters, and Akainu shoots a magma blast and destroys it. Whitebeard catches the magma, and he blows it out like it's a birthday cake? Like it's like it's a fire. He's just like... 
and he, you know, the magma cools. And that's kind of like the first several of these episodes. And then in walks, who else but Ors Jr.? You I, remember Ors. Yeah, you remember Ors. He's the big guy that Mario controlled back on Thriller Bark. Well, it turned out he had a son. And I think that this is actually Ors the third, but everyone calls him Junior. I don't know if the middle generation is going to show up or maybe I'm misremembering. But Ors Junior shows up and he is a big, big, big giant. And he's here to cause trouble. And the giants among the Marines try to stop him, but he's so big and so powerful that he like literally just swats them away. The Marine giants look like regular sized people next to this guy. Yes, exactly. But unfortunately, he is unable to save Ace. He's hit with Kuma's uh, Ursa shock attack, the one that he almost used to destroy all of Thriller Bark. Uh, He gets his leg cut off by Doflamingo. Great scene. Uh, Moria just (laughs) stabs him in the neck or head. I'm unclear. It went through his chest. It came out his back. Yeah. Okay. But Moria, you know, stabbed him and he has a very tearful scene where he's like slowly reaching to Ace and be like, if only I could reach him. And then he collapses. That's basically it. There's a lot of other stuff going on. Hancock attacks some of the Marines and they're like, what the hell? And she's like, I was only ordered to appear and I've appeared. So I've met my obligation. F off all of you stupid men. Uh, uh, Doffy has some great lines we'll get into later in the episode. Kobe is not having a good time. He's having a bit of a panic attack because there's so much blood and violence and death and destruction. And what is he going to be able to do? How is he, this small little pink boy, going to fight against a guy who can cause tsunamis or a guy who's made out of diamonds or a, a, a freaking phoenix, right? Uh, and a cane who's an asshole. We discovered that for sure. And, um... Panicked modest modest mouse plays in Kobe's head on an endless loop. Yes, exactly. So I would say that that has been your succinct summary. So we've talked a lot about how One Piece is basically like a set of one shot D and D campaigns with like the same main party. This is absolutely a D and D roll for initiative, <laughs> and then they just go back and forth taking their turns. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Doffy rolled a natural twenty on being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 pretty much. I'd say Davi probably put a lot of his points into charisma, but he's not pure charisma because he was able to, through some means, cut off a, a continent polar's leg, which is not something that you can just talk your way through. Absolutely. Did you like these episodes? I liked these episodes a lot. I know that One Piece has the humor, and I know that One Piece has the deep character moments and the connections and stuff. It has great openings and theme songs and stuff. But at the end of the day, I started watching One Piece when I was at an age where I wanted to see lots of punching, a lot of cool stuff. And this is an insane amount of punching, and there's logic and rules behind it. Uh, Akainu and Kizaru both leave. They're, all three of the admirals are sitting in their, in their magnificent chairs. And the light boy and the ice boy leave. And eventually Akainu at some point has to do something. And he says, like, those idiots, if all three of us left our post, wouldn't the world fall? Like, wouldn't Whitebeard win? And so, like, you get this character dynamic where two of these characters left one of them on the defensive to freeze the tsunami. One of them went on the offensive to try to defeat Whitebeard because he's hasty. Get it? He's always moving at the speed of light. But Akainu is like, I'm going to keep a level head. I'm going to stay here. I'm just going to see how things play out. Weird that the guy who does magma has such a cool head (laughs) he doesn't no to be clear Mm -hmm. i also liked these episodes okay well i was yeah oh i'm sure you were gonna ask i'm just saying i did like them that wasn't a passive aggressive like was there like a specific uh thing that you want to point out that like absolutely and we'll get into the specific monologue but i spent the entire time we were watching these episodes waiting for the doffy monologue Mm -hmm. because it is so good and it plays in an endless loop in my brain um especially last (laughs) summer when there was a lot of political distress going on. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really appreciate that this this fighting kind of represents the moral philosophies of the two sides. Of course. Yeah, yeah. The Marines are going to execute Ace, and that's justice, because of what he represents to the world as a whole. And the Whitebeard Pirates are going to save Ace because of what he represents to them specifically. Yeah. And so it's very much a freedom of the individual versus freedom of the group kind of combat. 
One Piece has always focused, not always, but it has strong ties to found family. Nami was not related to Bellamir and Nojiko. She was basically adopted, but that was her family. Chopper isn't even human, and he ended up with basically a father figure and a mother figure, though they weren't uh, in a relationship with each other, etc., etc. So it's interesting that to the Marines, Ace is represented by the familial bonds to the father he never knew. The father he rejected. But to the Whitebeard pirates, he represents their adopted family, their brother and or son, depending on, you know, to Marco it's a brother, to Whitebeard it's a son. And so, like, I think that's incredible. Also, special shout out to these episodes. Uh, At the very end, this changes slightly, but Luffy's not in these episodes. Luffy is not the main character of this, like, mini arc, if you want to call it that. And that's why I chose these episodes to be the episodes that we watch for this episode of the podcast, because it's the Whitebeard show. Whitebeard has a badass moment where uh, he's attacked and his crewmates protect him, just as we've seen Sanji and Zoro do for Luffy in Strong World. He Whitebeard can simply trust his subordinates to act in his best interest. This is kind of giving us a look at what Luffy might be like in 40 or 50 years. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, it's incredible. There's also a moment where someone's like, aha, Whitebeard, you've let your guard down. And Whitebeard goes, no, I didn't. It just destroys the guy. Whitebeard is awesome. Like, you can you can feel the weight of the pirate world behind him. Like, you can tell why the kids were doing were doing their jump rope chant about, like, don't mess with Whitebeard or he'll kill you. We, we go back to Buggy's warning to his crew never mess with the Whitebeard pirates and guess what the marines decided to do today today they chose violence so i think we are by you know we're talking about all the action because i think that's what sticks out in our minds but we did get some new information some interesting introspection on ace i do also want to say that garp during the last couple of episodes he's been kind of conflicted and he was remembering raising ace as a child basically and he seems conflicted. So he sits down next to Ace and he says something like, pirates don't deserve pity, but family is different. I just want to sit here. And, oh my God, Ugh, that, made, that made me tear up. Like, it's that's, that's a really good scene and it's a really human emotion, which I'd like to contrast with Kobe a little later. But for now, let's talk about Porcus D. Rouge. What did you think of her? I mean, we didn't get a lot of time with her. I wish that we could have seen more about what made her so special that like the king of the pirates chose her Mm. because we, we saw a little bit of her strength of character in not giving birth for, you know, six months after she should have, but like what, what specific interaction did she and gold Roger have that made him go? That's the one. Now, do you think that Oda has that information, but he couldn't show it to us yet? Because I think, and I've mentioned this before, Roger wanted to accomplish something before he died. He couldn't do it. That's why he inspired the Great Pirate Age. But if all of this was according to Keikaku, which means soccer, of course, unless you're in uh, uh, America, or unless you're in Europe, then you call it football. But... I think that maybe there's a reason that Roger fell in love with her. She also has the D initial, which we know is pretty important. And so I think maybe Oda has a plan, but couldn't show it to us because it's not time for him to reveal the end game yet. Yeah, it makes sense. She's very pretty. I like her freckles. She, yeah, uh, Ace inherited her freckles from his mom. I liked the flower in her hair. We had a scene that was, uh, we didn't see her face. It was like her... Her skin was, like, silhouetted, but we could see her hair and we could see the flower in it. And I just, I thought that was really neat. But I do wish that we had more time with her. At the same time, I don't know if now's the appropriate time to spend, like, six episodes or, you know, 14 chapters on her. Because people are probably itching for this whole Marine Ford war thing to start. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go into Fruits. Because everyone in this gosh dang show seems to have devil fruits. That's not true. There seem to be a couple of members of Whitebeard's commanders who seem to have just like regular episode or re- episodes, regular powers. There is a person, question mark. It seems to be a man wearing uh, like makeup and a kimono. We don't have information on him at this point in the story, but we find out later that, yeah, that's that's the case. It's a man who dresses as a woman. Him got guns. He fights with guns, right? We didn't see him use any kind of, like, he didn't summon, like, fireballs or, or whatever, turn people into worms. Whatever weird devil root powers Oda gave them. But all of the high-ranking people do. 
Whitebeard is the first one of these that we get revealed, and he ate the Quake Quake fruit. Quick note, in the Japanese, it's the Gura Gura fruit, and his laugh is Gura So his laugh represents the fruit that he has. Every time he laughed, I started cracking up because it just sounds so ridiculous. Like, if you haven't seen these episodes, go listen to just Whitebeard's laugh. It sounds so forced, and I know that the Piece Together folks really do not like, I think it's Moria's laugh, the key, she, 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 she. That actually sounds like a sound that a person would make with their mouth, but the... He, he sounds like a like a frog who's dying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not... Oh my gosh, we're not here to discuss Whitebeard's laugh, but I just did want to point out that his fruit and his laugh match. Whitebeard ate the Quake Quake fruit, and he can smash the uh, the air, it seems like, and he can send the tremors down into the ground, and then that creates a tsunami. It doesn't work immediately. He kind of starts the fight with like, hey, check out these big guns, and he does this attack. And a lot of the lower marines are like, what's going on? And then eventually you see a tsunami coming in the distance, and they go, oh my god! Right, because the way earthquakes work is it knocks the water back, essentially, and then however strong that was, the water comes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it follows... Like physics. science and physics and stuff. Did, uh, isn't this also the fruit that um, Sengoku said is like the most powerful devil it fruit? It is the fruit that could destroy the world, which is very interesting. Whitebeard and Blackbeard seem to have a couple of connections. For one, Marshall D. Teach was on Edward Newgate's ship. Two, one of them is named Whitebeard and the other one is named Blackbeard. White and black are often represented as opposites of each other. I think it's just safe to say that they are opposites. But, you know, symbolically, you use them to show two sides of opposing forces. And Blackbeard said that his fruit was the most powerful fruit in the world when he revealed it to Ace. And now we hear Whitebeard has the most destructive power in the world, or the one that could end the world. Also, you will notice that one of them, Blackbeard's, is a Logia. The other one, Whitebeard's, is a Paramecia. So it's just... It's fascinating, these little, like, nuggets of information, and I don't know if Oda did that on purpose, but I'm here for it. He probably did it on purpose. (laughs) Everything I know about Oda points to maybe him having done it on purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also have one of my favorite reveals uh, that we will discuss later, but a man named Jozu who ate the diamond diamond fruit and is a diamond man. Yes. And I think it's uh, Mihawk could not cut him. Yes. So Mihawk... Mihawk takes like a single step forward or something about his aura changes and literally everyone is like oh my god that's Mihawk like Boa Hancock looks at him Moria looks at him Doffy's like oh and uh he's yes (laughs) he 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 slowly pulls out his sword and he's looking at Whitebeard and he goes I just want to figure out the true distance between us and that man who seems like he's right in front of us So he swings his sword. He does this like shockwave attack. Kind of reminds me of Zoro's uh, cannon attack, his flying sword attack. But it's much bigger, much stronger. And it's carving through the ice. And Jozu jumps in the way and he deflects it. And and I think Jozu says something like, of course you won't be able to attack our head that easily or something like that. And Mihawk puts his sword away, apparently satisfied that this is the limit of his abilities. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Do you want to bring up the connection that some people might be remembering? Let's save that for discussion questions, because we have a lot of new info to get through. Okay. Yes, Jozu ate the diamond diamond fruit. It appears to be, I would assume, a paramecia, but maybe he's a logia. Maybe if you... Maybe Maybe he's diamonds all the way down. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Um, He has literal family jewels. (laughs) Oda's going to make that joke. You know that he is. Possibly, possibly. Uh, Hancock might be the one to get them, because that would connect back to the Amazon Lily stuff. So he was able to use his diamond powers to block an attack. He's also very strong. Like I said, he picked up a giant ice chunk, and I mean a giant ice chunk. And I don't know if his fruit ability um, enhances that in some way, or if maybe he just drinks a lot of protein bar or uh, protein shakes. The other fruit that we got that's really interesting is Marco the Phoenix. He's hit by laser blasts uh, shot by Kizaru, and he just heals. And... Kizaru makes the comment that mythical Zoans are rarer than Logia. Logia, out of the three basic types, is the rarest, but apparently rarer than that are the mythical animals. Marco's flames are explicitly blue. 
I guess, to differentiate the fact that they're not flames, they're they're phoenix flames. And like I said, he's able to recover from all of his attacks. So, uh, so cool. Is he completely invincible? Can he die? What's going on? Is he is he uh, uh, weak to um, disease or? Yeah, like. Marco's a really interesting character with a really interesting power, and I love the absolutely feral look on his face when Kizaru is like, my light beam didn't hurt you? And he goes, oh no, it hurt. <laughs> and then Kizaru says, don't lie, or something like that. And then Marco kicks him away, and Kizaru's like, man, that really hurt. And Marco goes, don't lie. Ah! I would never ship them, but I think that some people could use that as an excellent way to, to start that, that budding romance. Also, this raises the question, I don't think that we have time in today's episode, but what other mythical creatures are there? Do you have Kappas? Do you have that umbrella monster that is a a monster in in Japanese lore? I was thinking about this because uh, unicorns, for example, there's Mm -hmm. a lot of lore for them about healing. So would the unicorn unicorn fruit be able to heal any injury that other people receive? That would be a useful crew member. Is that how the fishmen and the merfolk were created? Was there someone who ate the mythical fruit mermaid and then they had a child and then maybe that child is just permanently mermaid and they propagated the system, the the race that way? I don't know. Uh, so it's just, it's really interesting. And I'm just curious to see what Marco can do in a combat situation. And Oda's not the type of person who would just give someone an invincible power. So there's gotta be a way to mess with Marco, but we don't know what it might be at this point. Absolutely. We've got one more devil fruit that was revealed. Akainu ate the magma magma fruit, which allows him to turn any part of his body into uh, magma. He seems to be really fond of turning his arm into magma, and then he shoots like a cannonball type thing, and he used that to explode the giant ice chunk that was going his way, and then it also exploded firework style and then little blobs of magma were going to like destroy the ships and stuff. And Whitebeard was able to protect his ship, but one of the other ships got destroyed. That kind of a thing. I appreciate that he looks like he's wearing like a Hawaiian shirt. Yes. And he's a volcano man. <laughs> That's absolutely Do you good. think his magma burns hotter than Ace's fire? Probably, right? Because fire reaches a certain temperature and it kind of stays there, whereas magma is way hotter. Magma is extremely hot. Like, stuff can catch on fire just being in the air next to magma in some places. At the same time, using anime logic, I wonder if Ace can make his flames burn hotter, and I wonder if maybe magma is just magma. Does that make sense? I think so. Uh, But yeah, we'll have to see what's going on with that. Are the two fruits related in some way? Is there like a... Is there, like, a way to take, like, a devil fruit? Like, this devil fruit allows me to make my neck longer. And then, like, you hit it with, like, super waves, and now you have a fruit that allows you to make all of your limbs longer? Like, is there a natural evolution? Are there families of devil fruits? Yeah, is there a hierarchy? I really want the book that Blackbeard referenced reading. That shows you every devil fruit that exists. Sanji also mentioned, having looked through it, and he knew that he wanted to eat the clear, clear fruit that Absalom had. There's one more piece of information that I personally was really excited to talk about, and that's that giants are apparently human. Yes. The Marines say Ors Jr. is still human, so gunfire should work. But that's interesting because they absolutely do not consider mermaids or fishmen human. Right, So yeah. giants are just big people, but, and that makes sense too for why they can interbreed, but I don't think we've seen a half human, half fishman. Mm, okay, we, mm, but no, because uh, uh, Big Pan from... Uh, Foxy oh, you're ship right. is half fishman, half giant. So maybe he is human and the world is just racist. <laughs> yeah, I think if I had to guess, I assume that there's racism against giants who are like, oh, they're going to crush us because like there's natural differences there and that kind of thing. But I think if you look at a giant, you can go, yeah, they look just like us. Unless they're a continent polar, the continent polar seem to have horns. But, you know, regular giants seem to just be someone took a person in Photoshop and did the scale up, you know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas fish people and mer people, oh, they got fins. They got like different colored skin. That's gross. That's weird. And so I think that if you had to explain away the bigotry and the racism and stuff, I think it would come down to 
One of them is obviously different in being, being bigger, but it's not so weird and alien as these as these other creatures. Yeah. Plus, you can point at fish and be like, fish are stupid, we eat them. And then you can point at fish people, and I guess there'd probably be some sick weirdos who would be like, I can eat them, same as I can eat fish people. But if you point at a giant, you're not going to think, yeah, that's just like this species of people. No, you're going to think that's a person. Yeah, okay, fair. So, now we do have one more... I guess new info, not really, but we got a new opening for these episodes. It is called One Day. It is softer than a lot of other openings, and it mostly reflects on Luffy and Ace's relationship. It's kind of like there's a war-torn imagery area, I don't know the right word, and Luffy is like slowly running towards Ace, uh, and I think maybe it ends with them like hugging or embracing or something, but it's it's very much so about Ace's life and his relationship with Luffy. Do you have anything else that you really want to say? No, not really. Um, when, when the opening started playing, I went, oh yeah, it's the sad Ace opening, <laughs> and that's just how I remember it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think we can probably safely move on to favorite scenes and quotes. Okay. I want to tackle this first one because it, it relates to another thought that I have. So uh, Garp and Suru, who are, I think, like the two oldest members of the Marines, it seems like, and they seem to have had a long past of like working together, but they're standing next to each other and, and Suru's like, where's Whitebeard? Because at this point, Whitebeard's allies have shown up. I think the number was like 43 ships. But where is Whitebeard and where are his 16 commanders? Side note, I wanted to look up Y16 because I wonder if Oda picked that number on purpose, but uh, I forgot to. But if 16 has some religious or mythical or spiritual significance, maybe that's why Oda picked it. But Sewer is like, where's Whitebeard? And Garp says, I think Whitebeard will appear from where we least expect. Which, A, is a badass line that fits into pirate lore. The pirates are like the chaos gremlins of the world, whereas the marines are the order. But also, at the end of these episodes, Luffy comes falling from the sky. Uh. So Garp is like, I think the best pirates are the type who will appear where you least expect. And here comes rookie pirate of the year falling from the sky. So I think that's a really nice connection. It's subtle. They don't look at the camera and say, hey, do you remember the thing Garp said? But it's there if you're paying attention. Excellent. Well done. Yes. I only wrote down one of these quotes because like I said, it's one of my favorite things in the world. Do you want me to go over that one now or do you want to do the other two? And no, then we'll no, no. Go ahead and do one. this one. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to read a slightly different version than the subtitles we saw because I like the phrasing a little better. Um, Different people have different opinions on that. But <clears throat> from Don Quixote do Flamingo, pirates are evil. The Marines are righteous. These terms have always changed throughout the course of history. Kids who have never known peace have different values from kids who have never known war. Those who stand at the top determine what's right and what's wrong. This very place is neutral ground. Justice will prevail, you say? Of course it will. Whoever wins this war will become justice. How telling for his outlook on life. Yeah. yeah, Do, yeah. Do Flamingo is very much a might makes right kind of character. He is. He ran a human auction shop, which is absolutely despicable. He had people serving underneath him who failed, so he decided to have them kill each other, which is horrendous. Do Flamingo is a monster. We were told his battle capacity is unknown in the previous episode that, like, uh, summarized all of the warlords. And uh, he's just always laughing. He's just enjoying himself. He's This is a man who I think has cracked a little bit under the pressure of the world. Yeah, he can, he can justify his own monstrosity because justice is whatever you take for yourself in yeah, his worldview. No yeah, no one can stop him. And he's not wrong. You know, the phrase history is written by the winner, like, that's absolutely true. If if uh, the Cold War or World War II had gone a different way, history books would be talking about how evil, like, capitalism or democracy or that sort of thing is, and, like, the true thing that rules the world is, of course, the the strength of your fists or the, the, the family that you have or whatever. Uh, this is we're not getting that deep into politics, but I'm just saying that, like, Doffy here is understanding that, like, if Sengoku and the three admirals were defeated and Whitebeard saved Ace, it would rein in a new era where people around the world would say, 
Whitebeard is basically our king. Maybe some people will try to dethrone them. Those 187 allied countries would turn their cannon fire on him, but it would it would change the perception of the common people. Absolutely. The other great thing about this is this is another example of kind of a dark side of freedom mm. being contrasted against Luffy. So Luffy's version of freedom is he does whatever he wants. He doesn't hurt other people because that infringes on their freedom. He will hurt people if they mess with him, but you're right. He doesn't start aggression. He doesn't go out of his way to infringe on the freedoms of other people. Whereas what Doffy is saying here is that freedom is doing whatever you want, even if it hurts people, because if you're at the top, they can't complain. Who's going to stop me, honestly? And, And his definition of justice being whoever wins is very interesting because I've always felt that justice is righting of wrongs. But Daffy is saying there's no such thing as right or wrong. Mm. And that's decided by whoever's in power at that given moment. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It will be interesting to see how where Daffy goes into the future. I think that it, it by being the asshole who killed Bellamy and being the asshole who runs the human shops, two things that are connected to Luffy's adventure so far. I think it's fair to say, even without future knowledge, you are probably thinking Luffy and Doffy are going to butt heads, especially the way Doffy talks. Like, he doesn't seem like the sort of person, like, if we had met Jinbei before he had interacted with Luffy, we might have been able to be like, oh, he's an honorable person. Maybe he will get along with Luffy. And uh, I think that for uh, Doffy, it's very clear that I don't think they're going to get along so much. Also, here's a quick note. It seems clear that Doflamingo's power is related to puppets. The very first time he ever showed up, he made one of the Marines, I can't remember what they did, but they like they were like, oh, I can't control my body. And they were kind of like, whatever, as Doffy was twisting his fingers. That's very puppet-esque. He did that to Zachris, I think is his name, when he made Zachris kill Bellamy. Uh, he did that again here to one of Whitebeard's commanders. I think his name is like Buffalo or something. So, okay, maybe he ate the puppet puppet or like the doll doll fruit. But he was able to cut Ors Jr.'s leg. And we don't know how, like, if you think about it, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, Ors kind of noticed his legs were trapped in place, which fits with what we've seen of Doffy's powers, being able to control people's bodies. But then cutting it off, how did that work? Right. And Doffy, I was going to say, he's one of the only one whose powers are not explicitly described, mm-hmm. which is another point in the column of Oda's probably setting him up to be a future antagonist. Yes, and I absolutely love him. Like, if I had to pick one, if I had to pick my favorite warlord, I think he would be it. I love the chaotic, crazy characters. But when we get to the episodes, if we ever get to the episodes where he does the thing, that doesn't mean that I condone his actions. And it doesn't mean that I'm going to make jokes about like, well, if you think about it, he really had his own perspective. Yeah, he had his own perspective. A lot of evil people had their own perspective. I don't condone his actions. But he is charismatic and he's very interesting and he's enigmatic. He's, he's just, he's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So talking about justice, I think. Yes. That's a great segue into one of these other quotes you wrote down. <laughs> oh my god. Is Akainu a nice man, Joel? Akainu? <sighs> Akainu is not a nice man. Here's a quick note. This is something that I never would have picked up on, but someone else mentioned it, and if you pay attention, like, oh my god. Akainu is just a title. It just means red dog. And uh his real name is something Sakazaki, I think. Uh something like that. During the bombardment of Ohara, Robin almost got on a ship of civilians and left, and it was bombed. And you see a character that we know it was Aokiji, I think it was Aokiji, being like, man, that Captain Sakazaki sure is extreme in his hatred for pirates. That's Akainu. Uh, so Akainu is... um. Yeah, in the Pirate Warriors 3 game, they represent the different types of justice that the admirals are, and so I believe Aokiji is lazy justice, uh, Kizaru is hazy justice, Akainu's is absolute justice. He sees a soldier running from the battlefield because he has a wife and a family at home who need him, and he might die fighting This earthquake man, his phoenix, his diamond man, and all of these other crazy, insane people. And Akanu says, 
We Navy soldiers are fighting pirates with the justice of the world emblazoned on our own backs. By the way, in case you forgot, the kanji on the back of all Marines' uniforms is the kanji for justice. Anyone who turns tail and runs cannot be called a Navy soldier. I would call him a speck of dust. And then Akainu murders that man with magma. Not a pleasant way to go. So I would say Akainu is, um... It's undecided if he's a good person or not, but you know, it just his, uh, his, like... his sense of justice might be a little extreme. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's very different from Doffy's because Akainu is not saying there is no right and wrong. Akainu is saying there's right and there's wrong and wrong will be punished. Uh-huh. Even in the face of Armageddon, I will not compromise well, in this. Yeah. Well, and it's, 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 um, in some cases you might have a character who's willing to accept a lesser evil over a greater evil. You know, oh, this criminal uh, was robbing banks but hasn't killed anyone. This criminal is going to launch nuclear missiles and kill everyone. I will team up with the bank robber in order to stop the nuclear person. Uh, Akainu would just kill both of them and he would not consider t- teaming up with them in any way. So, yeah, he seems to be setting up in a way that he is a major antagonist. Kazaru, scary but lazy. Uh, Aokiji, Scary, but he seems to kind of have, like, specific ways of operating, but Akainu seems like he will burn every single one of those ships to the ground, and he will kill all 16 commanders and Whitebeard and their families. Good luck, uh, Ace and Whitebeard Pirates. Yeah. Hello, Ace from the Whitebeard Pirates. (laughs) Hello, Akainu from the Marines. (laughs) You are dead now. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's one of joel's favorite meme formats right now so i had to slip it in oh man it's so good uh ba-da, ba-da. so when luffy was getting ready to fight eneru i remember reading a lot of the comments uh in, on the manga that well luffy has a natural advantage is there anything that you think has a natural advantage over magma could you squirt him with water water sand maybe maybe See, sand would be advantageous against fire, because you can use sand to put fire out. But can you put magma out? I don't think so. Wind? Yeah. And like we said before, uh, magma is just like this absolute calamity of a, of a, of a weapon. <laughs> when volcanoes erupt, the magma cools off and becomes rock, and then it's not, it's not hot, it's not dangerous anymore. So if you jacked a canoe off... That would neutralize him. Christ, I kind of want that to be the final thought because I don't want to talk to you anymore. This podcast is over. It's on an indefinite hiatus until we come back next week with episode 108. No. Uh, Well, okay. Here's the thing. We saw Whitebeard blow out the bit of magma that was on his... um, Gosh, I don't remember the name of his weapon, but on the end of his pole. Could they just blow on a Kanu? Like, really hard? (laughs) Just get, like, 16 guys surrounding him and they're all going... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the yeah, character slowly lowers because he's he's magma all the way through so you'd have to find somebody or some group of people who could blow on him at on every the- angle all at once so the magma's not keeping itself warm yeah 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 absolutely so cut off his limbs with hockey one by one and then blow those out <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I actually forgot that I wrote down this quote, so we don't need to talk about it at length, but I did write it down. There's a little bit more information. Uh, It's related to, you know, Whitebeard's uh, Quake Quake Fruit, but don't think that our superior superior forces will guarantee us victory. We could well fail. Okay, I wasn't sure if that said fail or fall. I need to zoom in on my notes Uh, because that man has the power to destroy the world. And that's Sengoku. Huh. Bold of Sengoku to declare that the Marines have the superior forces. I'm sure he just meant numbers, but yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure the Marines don't have ve- very many powers that can match all the powers we see on display from the Whitebeard Pirates. Yeah, speaking of powers, isn't it interesting that all three of the Admirals are Logia fruit types? Now, we've seen very little of these characters before they were uh, appointed to the position of Admirals. As I've said before, we've seen uh, a younger Aokiji looking up to Garp. I believe that was a strong world tie-in. And he said something about, like, how cool Garp is, so that could be a hint at his ice powers. We've seen them at the uh, destruction of Ohara, but we don't really know when they might have gotten their devil fruits. So, question, could the Marine, uh, you know, the 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 champions of justice, could the, uh, what are they called? The Gorosei, the five Elder Stars... Could they just have a collection of, like, really scary, really powerful devil fruits? And once you become an admiral, they're like, here's your power. 
Yeah, I could see that. That I mean, I feel like if the world government really wants to control the world, it would be in their best interest to collect every devil fruit they find and just store them and only give them out to very specifically chosen people. Yeah, well, I mean, we got a hint to that with Spandam, too, where Spandam said, I have connections and that's how I managed to get these two fruits that he ended up giving to uh, Kaku and Khalifa. I know One Piece names, okay? But it is just very interesting that all three of them are Logia, the most powerful devil fruit types. They're all natural disasters, do you think that Sengoku used to be an admiral? Like, it seems like it's a promotion thing, right? Like, he's probably a fleet admiral because he served so well as an admiral for a couple of years, or more. Is he a Logia Fruit Devil Power? We've never seen him fight in a battle. He could be. At one point, somebody calls him the Buddha. And I'm really curious what that means. a religious thing, man. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Did he eat the Ascension Ascension no me? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, it's a religious thing, but it's weird to ascribe that title to a living person. So, like, did he eat some kind of devil fruit that makes everybody super zen? Can he give <laughs> off good vibe waves? Like, what? Oh, my goodness, What are we yeah. looking at here? I will say, I don't know enough about Buddhism to be able to comment on it, but that... There's got to be a reason that he's called that, you know, whether whether it's something specific to the world Oda's created or if it's some connection to the real world Buddha. But we'll have to see what's going on with that. I didn't write this down, but Suru appears to have eaten a devil fruit where she can launder people. Some 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 uh, young. Oh, my God. She's part of Garp's tax scheme. <laughs> so, so some young, uh, like no name members of the Whitebeard Pirates are like, we're going to attack you, old lady. And there's like a flash. You don't really see how it's done. But then they're like hanging up on a laundry line. And they're like, I feel so I think it was fresh or relaxed or something. And she's like, it's a million years too early for you to take me on. Best line in anything ever, and I love that Suru is the one that gets to deliver it. There's a lot of people who really want Suru to get more time, more play, because she seems like she's a peer of Garb's, not literally just in terms of rank, but like they seem to trust each other, they seem to have a history together, probably not romantic, but maybe, you know, they're about the same age. But I just think that we see Garp do a lot of crazy things. He's throwing cannonballs with his hands faster than a cannon can fire them. And yet Suru seems to just kind of be watching things and be like, I don't really have, I have a bad feeling about it. It's this. another great example, too, of Oda giving a more domestic fruit to a woman. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Like, we've got a magma guy, we've got an ice guy, we've got a light guy. What's the super strong older marine woman's power? Laundry. <laughs> Uh, Robin's power is technically a flower and that kind of thing. So yeah, keep note of that. There's a couple of other characters coming up who have fruits that are also more related to more feminine things. And like, whatever, man, it's Oda's story, but there are some very small things that I think uh, could be tweaked to make it better. Absolutely. Now we did write down a quick note, but I'm kind of going to kind of wrap it into a discussion question here. We saw a lot of really interesting character designs. Were there any particular like whitebeard pirates or marines that stood out to you whitey bay is bay like how she's called the ice witch she's got blue hair she's very pretty she seems competent she is one of the 16 commanders and i like her a lot i asked that question explicitly so you could talk about whitey bay so <laughs> you're welcome uh, uh the quick note we wrote down was that there's a whitebeard ship run by the declan brothers the calvin brothers yeah oh, and they seem to be twins they look very much like each other and whatever and i'm wondering if they're related to the risky brothers under lola because they've got like the same eyes like the yeah. dark circles and everything so they could be older brothers they could be dads yeah exactly i don't i assume that risky is not the family name of the two brothers under lola i assume that they're like they take risks uh, so they could be related and, you know, twins run in families, I believe. And so I think there's a connection there. This seems like the sort of show where like some people just have children and those children are very similar to them. Related to that, one of the other commanders under Whitebeard looks a lot like uh, Scratchman Apu. So I think that maybe Scratchman Apu's dad is one of the 16 commanders on Whitebeard's ship. And again, Oda seems to have this um, romanticization that if your parents are a pirate, you're more likely to be a pirate. Luffy's kind of the weird exception. His family has all of the different uh, specialties. But Usopp wants to be a pirate because of his dad. Um, 
the DeCalvin brothers might want to become pirates because of their dads, and maybe Scratch one of who wants to become a pirate because of his dad. Who knows? Yeah, could be. I like that a lot. Any designs that stood out for you? Mm, I mean, Marco is really interesting. Why does his head look like a pineapple? Because Odo draws a diverse set of bodies. What, you think that's going to be his tragic backstory? One day he ate a pineapple whole, and then it got stuck, and then his head became a pineapple? No, he he has a different body shape. Yeah, I just... It makes me laugh every time to be like, it's the pineapple man. Uh, but no, there were there were so many designs that it's hard to pick out just one. You mentioned, I think his name is Izu. If I didn't... I think it's Izo with an O. Izo. Okay. If I didn't know he was a man, I would have assumed he was like a badass gunslinger woman. Yeah. Uh-huh. Absolutely. A lot of people have taken the time to comb through each of these chapters and they look for all the little details and they ask Oda and the SBS, for example. And so for my knowledge is a little bit secondhand, but yeah, I think that some people at some point figured out like, oh, I think that this person is actually a man, but they're clearly wearing feminine dress. And Oda's like, yep, that's them. Yeah, he probably uses like Boku or something at some point. They're like, isn't that a masculine pronoun? Gotcha, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think Jozu's design was particularly interesting, but his fruit power is. Okay. Yeah. So if you'll remember way back to Alabasta with me. God, that was like 1992 or something. It was a while ago. Zoro was fighting against Mr. One, who ate the steel steel fruit, I think. Yeah, uh, the dice dice fruit, I think is right. his official he, name. He ate the dice dice fruit, but functionally his body is made of steel. And so Zoro goes through the whole listening thing and he learns to cut steel. And then he goes, well, I guess next I better learn to cut diamonds. <laughs> and now here we have Jozu and we have Mihawk and we have somebody explicitly say Mihawk is believed to be the world's strongest swordsman. I think that's the uh, flower swordsman who says that. Yes, 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 who yes, yes, yes Also yes. is kind of interesting design wise. Uh, Vista is his name. But Mihawk attacks Jozu and cannot cut him. So Zoro has stated a goal that would put him past Mihawk's current level of strength. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we're going to see Zoro fight Jozu. I think it would be kind of weird because how would they end up on opposite sides of a battle? But I think we absolutely will see Zoro get to the point where he can cut diamonds, and that will be a sign that he has surpassed Mihawk as a swordsman. Absolutely. Yeah, so really quickly, just kind of looking at the wiki, uh, I don't, I know the names of the most important commanders, and by most important, I mean Marco, Jozu, Ace, and Vista, also the late Thatch, who was killed by Blackbeard. The rest of them are faces in the background, and maybe they're really cool, maybe they aren't, I don't know, but they don't get a lot of play, but Marco the Phoenix... You have Ace number two. Jozu is the third division commander. Vista, I think his name is uh, Flower Sword Vista. I believe he's the fifth division captain. Uh, you also have a character named Blamenko. And I believe that we see him pull a giant cartoonishly large hammer out of like a pocket in his cheek. And you and I both went, what? <laughs> so that's a thing that exists, but we don't know anything about him. There's a guy named Rakuyo who has hair that kind of reminds us, uh, like it's dreadlocks kind of a thing, and he has like a long mustache. You have Namur, who is a shark fishman. He looks pretty cool. He's kind of a short guy, but he's got like little fangies coming out from underneath his his mouth. Uh, Blanheim, who I do not recognize in any shape or form. Uh, Curiel is the one that I was saying I think is uh, Scratchman Apu's dad. King Du. Kind of a weird name. Was he actually like a devil fruit or something? Uh, Haruta, that's the one who kind of looks like, um, kind of like a priest, I guess you would say. And you were like, is that a boy or a girl? And I'm pretty sure she's a girl, but, uh, Atmos is the uh, one that tried to fight Doffy and got his ass handed to him. Uh, someone named Speed Jiru, who gives me kind of like a crusader kind of a vibe from his appearance. Fossa is the man with the cigar in his mouth, who I think fights with by setting his swords on fire, which is a freaking cool way to fight. And Izo is the uh, sharpshooter, is, seems to be his abilities. Very good. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe that you didn't remember Shark Boy. Like, I would have thought that I that would have I can't believe I didn't remember Shark Boy either. This ep- these episodes threw a lot at us, and they we did. watched them a couple days ago. So, you know, my brain is already on to the most recent thing we watched Zombieland Saga? We watched a little bit of Zombieland Saga. This is not chatting with the hosts. <laughs> 
<laughs> focus. Okay, the last thing is that everyone seems to indicate that Mihawk is just out here killing time. Like, I think Doffy, one of the other uh, Shichibukai, was like, hey, did, did you even show up to fight, or are you just here to kill time, or something like that? So is Mihawk just super depressed? Is he just wandering the world looking for something that can excite him? Is he the One Punch Man of the One Piece universe? Yeah. Or is he waiting for something? Is he is he killing time until January 1st, 2044, when the savior will be born? And Mihawk ha- is the strongest sword because he, his family, he comes from a long line of people who swore to protect the chosen one. He's wandering around looking for a worthy disciple and he hasn't found one yet. So he thought, you know, big battle, lots of swordsmen, maybe he'll find someone here. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I really like the idea that the world is waiting for something and it's going to be Luffy. But like the world is waiting for something and people like the Gorosei and Sengoku know what it is, but they want to stop it because it would be bad. People like Blackbeard or Doflamingo want to use that to their advantage to try and um, become more powerful. And people like Luffy are going to accidentally stumble into it or be involved with it, and uh, they'll end up using it as a force of good. They'll change the world in some way. So maybe Mihawk is aware of whatever that thing is, and he will be the one to... uh, He wants to protect it in some way, or he wants to in some way shape it. I also think that is why Shanks is kind of wandering around and doing stuff. I don't think that he's looking for the One Piece. I think he's looking for something else related to this destined time. That could also be why Roger found a woman who had the D initial, because maybe there's something about the D that that is related to this uh, special time, this special person. And so if his child had a D... He's hoping that his child will bring the big D energy. (laughs) Absolutely. Also... We found out in these episodes that Ace wanted Whitebeard to become King of the Pirates, and Sengoku's like, you're a liar, kid. I don't think that you want him to be the Pirate King at all. I think you want to be the Pirate King. And Whitebeard doesn't seem to have any interest in taking on the One Piece. Uh, I believe that you had his meeting with uh, Shiki in One Piece Strong World Episode Zero or whatever it was called. But, like, his name is Edward Newgate. It's not Edward D. Newgate, so maybe Whitebeard can't become the next person or whatever. Maybe he picked Ace because he was like, hey, Ace got that that initial. So there seems to be something going on, and uh, I just, I'm very excited to, to, to see how it evolves, and I'm hoping that Mihawk is related to that, because if he was depressed, that would make me really sad. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Maybe he just needs to find a nice lady to sit down with, and that will give his life purpose, you know? He just, just needs <laughs> to dedicate himself. You t- Are you telling me that he just needs to find the right sheath for his sword? Oh, Jesus. No, that's not what I'm saying. And that has been your <laughs> do 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 final thought. Outro goes here. Thanks for listening, everyone. Next episode of the podcast, we will be covering episodes 466 through 473. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Ha ha! What a great episode of King of the What Now, your One Piece podcast that started from the very beginning and stars these two doofuses. If you want to follow us on social media, Twitter is the best place to do that. I am at K-O-T-W-N underscore pod. And I am at Pirate Ghost Host. Absolutely, yes. We share all sorts of thoughts on there, some related to the podcast, some related to other things. But you can also reach us through email at kingofthewhatpod at gmail.com, or you can also find us on Patreon. We would love some subscribers or supporters, whatever the technical term is. Patrons. Patrons. So fancy and grown up. Uh, And you can find that at patreon.com slash king of the what pod you can find all sorts of things like bonus episodes and you get to see the full cold open candidates not just the ones that make it into the episode maybe someday if i learn to draw i'll put stuff up there we're always looking for suggestions and feedback and speaking of which please take a moment to rate and review our podcast wherever you get us from so itunes spotify scrivener that's for writing but wherever you listen to our podcast take 
take a moment to leave a review. It helps other people find us. We are so grateful to all of our listeners, and we couldn't do this without you. Absolutely. Word of mouth is super powerful, so if you have a friend who likes One Piece and they haven't heard of us, just direct them to the latest episode. And if they hate us, they can tell us why. And if there's an actionable item, we'll try to please you. That's how this works. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.